Okay, we're back to our Bible Institute. We're looking at the reconstruction of God's creation. We've already went through the gap. We've looked at the first scene where you had God out in eternity by himself. We've seen where Lucifer reigned as a temporary king under God, of course, and had a throne and everything else. We've seen where he rebelled and God brought a universal flood that wiped out the original creation. And now we're going to see the reconstruction of God's creation. And that's what you've got in Genesis chapter 1. So Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. So we've talked about the gap and how we actually believe there's a gap here after verse 1. There was a time between Genesis 1.1 1, 1 and 1.2 1, where Lucifer had a throne and was reigning as a king under the king of kings. We've talked about the spirit world that would have been inhabiting the earth with him during this time as well. We talked about the cherubim and the seraphim, the angels, and you can go back and listen to those and get an understanding on what those guys are. And a lot of them rebelled. A lot of the angels rebelled with Lucifer. And a catastrophe took place that left the earth as it is in Genesis 1-2 without form and void. It says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And that was like you were before you got saved. On the inside you were without form and void. You were full of darkness. And I want to show you how the reconstruction process of the earth pictures what happened to you at salvation. That way we get a theme going along with this. And I just think that makes it more relatable. And it really just sets up in your heart more as we go through it. When you add like a theme to it. A, a Bible given theme. And <clears throat> this first day we're going to look at day one. And it's going to be dividing light from darkness. But in Colossians 1.13, going back to talking about you again, it says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. That was you when you got saved. He delivered you from the power of darkness. Day one of the reconstruction process in Genesis 1 is dividing light from darkness. When the earth was in darkness, the Lord said, let there be light. When I believed on Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost moved in, into me, just like he moved on the face of the waters in Genesis chapter 1, and I was filled with the light of God. So you see the similarity there? Notice how Paul compares God bringing light into the world in Genesis 1-3. He compares that to your salvation. In 2 Corinthians 4-6, it says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He said, for God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, that's what he did in Genesis 1, hath shined in our hearts. So you see how what happened in Genesis can be a picture of what took place in you at salvation. Look what happens in Genesis 1-3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Just like when you got saved. The moment you believed, God basically said, let there be light in you, and there was. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. So God divides, God divided something. He divided the light from the darkness. Now, you know what this pictures? It pictures your spiritual circumcision. Now, maybe you think that's a big word. You never heard of those two words put together like that before. Maybe you aren't familiar with it, so I'll explain it. The spiritual circumcision is in Colossians 2, 11 through 13. Now, Colossians 2, 11 says, In whom also 
ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Now, if it's a circumcision made without hands, it's a spiritual one. And putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. See that? Putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So when you get born again, the moment you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, God divides some things. He divides your soul from your flesh. He does a spiritual cutting, a spiritual circumcision, and he divides. And do you know what that means? That means you're eternally secure. Because if your soul has been circumcised from your flesh, you, you've been cut loose from your flesh, then when you mess up and sin, those sins that you do are in the flesh. And those sins, even though they're on your flesh, they don't contaminate the soul. See, before you were saved, your soul was stuck to your flesh. Notice it says, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, before you were saved, your soul was stuck to your flesh, so any time you sin, it went on to the soul. Now, you got born again. He washed you. He washed your soul clean with the blood of the Lord Jesus. You got the blood of the Lord Jesus applied to your soul. It's completely sinless, spotless, perfect. And not only that, he's cut your soul loose from your flesh. So now when you mess up and sin in the flesh, which still sins because it's not born again, it's not a new, your flesh isn't the new creature. When you sin in the flesh, those sins don't contaminate the soul anymore. And that's what's pictured in Genesis 1, dividing light from darkness. So God performed an operation on you. The Holy Ghost moved in, baptized you into the body of Christ, and that is a baptism that you didn't even know took place. It had nothing to do with the water. It's a spirit baptism where the Holy Spirit took you and baptized you into the body of Christ. Everybody who's saved is in the body of Christ. And your soul is now as righteous as Jesus Christ. Your flesh, on the other hand, is still sinful, still vile, still wicked, and can walk in darkness so the lord cut your soul loose from your flesh now the sins of the flesh cannot contaminate your soul it stays righteous and it's covered with the blood of the lord jesus christ and when god cut your soul loose from your flesh he divided the light from the darkness just like he did in genesis 1 4 and i explained that twice there just for people who maybe they've never heard that before. A lot of people, they're going to be like, you know, I already knew that. You didn't have to say it twice. But a lot of people has never heard of the spiritual circumcision before, and it proves eternal security. So Genesis 1, 3, and 4, this day 1, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. So God divides. And this is where the battle really begins God dividing light from darkness. You're either walking in light or walking in darkness. Genesis 1, 5, And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. In the evening and the morning were the first day. Now remember, this is before the sun was even created. Before the sun was even created, the S-U-N sun, you're dealing with a God that is so powerful that he can make the sun, make it stay put, and make it keep burning. And I can't even look at the sun without getting a headache a lot of times. But God is so powerful, he holds it there in place. And with this verse, you also see that God is the inventor of time. Uh, he didn't need the sun to have time. Why would you go against the Almighty God, who invented time itself, he's the one that called the light day, 
and the darkness night. You also see from this verse that there are 24-hour days in Genesis. This is 24-hour days. It's not, you know, a lot of people think, well, well, each one of these days may represent a thousand years, or each one of these days may represent a million years. But no, it says the first day consisted of an evening and a morning. It wasn't a million years for each day. These are literal 24-hour days with one evening and one morning. And now, although each day actually pictures a 1,000-year time span for all of history, these are literal 24-hour days. And you see, each day can represent a 1,000 years and a 1,000-year time throughout history because one day with the Lord is as a 1,000 years and a 1,000 years is as one day. So if Jesus was here 2,000 years ago, then it's on to, in, the, in the mind of God, in the eyes of God, the way he views time, it's only been like two days ago because he sees one day with the Lord as a 1,000 years and a 1,000 years is one day. So each of these days, we can look at it that it pictures a 1,000-year a time frame from all throughout history. So day one, what did he do? Day one, he divided, he... He looked at the the earth that was without form and void. It was full of darkness because of what happened with Lucifer. He sinned. He rebelled. God brought a universal flood, flooded out the earth, dropped it from the top of the creation all the way to the bottom. Now he's looking at the earth and he says, let there be light. He divides the light from the darkness. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and divided the light from the darkness. Now, day two, he divides the waters. Genesis 1, 6 through 1, 8. It says, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. So what you have is the earth was completely just covered in water from that universal flood or how else did why was the water there think about that you know it doesn't say he anything about him creating the water yet it, it was just already there he had already created it a long time ago before this so he says he's going to divide it now and he's going to put a firmament there a space he puts a space there that divides the water and there's well there's water on top now and then water on the very bottom and he says let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters and god made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament and it was so so what you have is you've got the firmament's going to be where he puts the sun, moon, and stars. And earth, obviously, is in there too. And you got waters below earth and waters way up above earth. And I remember telling this to somebody one time. And, you know, when people are just clueless when it comes to the Bible. They're so clueless when it comes to the Bible that when you say stuff like this, they look at you like you're crazy. That's why, you know, average person, average lawless person, I don't just go around and say, you know, the earth's got water up above it, up in space and all this stuff because there's just so much crazy stuff going on. The stuff like that for the Bible, they just think you're crazy. And this guy looked at me and, and said, that's just hippie stuff or something. But really it's not. If The, the Bible says in Psalms that, uh, praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens, showing you that there's water above the second heaven. So there's water up there. And what does it say in Revelation 15? There's a sea of glass. God's throne sits on a sea of glass. And beneath that hard surface, there's water. And Job talks about it. He talks about the face of the deep is frozen. That's that, that sea of glass up there. 
So there's waters up above, but there's waters down below. But notice that God is continuing to divide. It says, and God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And you're going to see there's more than one heaven, as we'll talk about. So notice that God is continuing to divide. And we saw how the first day can picture your salvation. You were full of darkness, but you believe from the heart on Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit moved in. God said, let there be light and you were a new creature. Now on day two, the Lord continues to divide. Specifically here, he's going to divide the waters. And these waters are from the catastrophe that took place between the first two verses of Genesis 1. It was a universal flood that flooded out the original creation, dropped the earth uh, from being uh, at the top of the creation, right next to the God's heaven, all the way to the bottom. Now what the Lord did is made a firmament, a big open space, in the midst of these waters, and it divided the water from the water. It put water at the very top, water at the bottom, with the earth in the middle in that open space. So now you have water up above, and you have water down below, with the earth out of the water in, and put inside that big open space. And this is where he will also put the sun and the moon and the stars. But think about that phrase where it says, he divided the waters. And if you've been listening to me a while, then you've probably heard me talk about how the word of God itself is like water. And many verses uh, lead us to believe that. Ephesians 5, 25 and 26 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Notice that washing of water by the word. And it says in Psalm 119.9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. So the Bible is the voice of God on paper. Right? It's God's mind on paper. It's his words on paper. And what does his voice sound like in Revelation 1.15? It says, In his feet, like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, in his voice as the sound of many waters. So, water pictures the word of God. And on the first day, it illustrated your salvation. Now the second day illustrates what you should do next, and that is dividing the waters, dividing the word of truth. If the waters picture the word of God, you rightly divide it. God divided the waters, you rightly divide the word of truth. In 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So the moment you get saved, you need to start reading your Bible, studying your Bible, memorizing it, praying over it, rightly dividing it. Now move on to day three. Day three, you got the reappearance of the earth, and you got plant life here. So this will be day three, reappearance of the earth and plant life. Genesis 1-9, and God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place. Now look at this. And let the dry land appear. And it was so. So the water that was on the earth that was still in the earth, he gathered it together into one place and it let the dry land appear. The dry land was already there. It was just covered in water. So notice when he pulls the water into one place, it causes the dry land to show up. Why is that? Most likely this is another hint that there had been a flood, a universal flood, that left all the land under water. And he moved that water back into one place, and the dry land appeared again. In Genesis 1.10, it says, And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. Now, notice that God named earth, and you'll, if you look it up, you'll see that the rest of the planets were named by people. So the rest of the planets are named after false gods. 
That's interesting. Genesis 1, 11 through 13, it says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, an herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. Notice when it talks about the grass and the trees, it says, whose seed was in itself after his kind. When you refer to a tree, you usually don't say, you know, him or his or hers. But God said, whose seed was in itself after his kind. So this is a great picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says after his kind. Do you know what? The Lord Jesus is referred to in the Bible in Jeremiah 23, 5. He's called a righteous branch. So when he says that the in the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, his is showing you the Lord Jesus. You see, after you're saved and rightly dividing the scriptures, you'll notice when those words of God start growing in you, you start reading the Bible and the words of God start growing in you, you will begin to bear fruit after his kind, after the Lord Jesus' kind. You'll not only be saved, but you'll be acting like a Christian. You'll be bearing fruit like the Lord. You'll be bearing fruit after his kind. He tells you what to do. He tells you how to do it. And even I gave you an example to follow, and it's all laid out in the scriptures. And when you follow the word of God, you'll bear fruit after his kind. If a safe person doesn't follow the word of God, then he won't bear fruit. But if you're a safe person and you're reading the word of God, Psalm 1, 1 through 3 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, and bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season." You'll bear fruit after his kind, after the Lord's kind. So day three, you had the reappearance of the earth and the dry ground and, and plant life. So day four, you got the sun, moon, and stars. Now we look back to that big open space, that big firmament out there again. In Genesis 1.14, it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So God, the Almighty himself, is the one who made the great light. Now, that's the sun. Notice that the earth is older than the sun. It was already there. It, the earth is already here before you get to verse 14, 15, 16, when he even begins to talk about the great light that he makes. So if God made the sun then why are there people who worship it? You know, the people who worship the sun should have worshiped the God who created the sun. That would make more sense because God shows his superiority over the sun by turning it dark many times in the Bible. In Matthew 24, 29, it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened. In Revelation 8, 12, it says the sun was smitten. The Lord just smacked it around a bit and knocked some of its lights out. It was smitten. Just like he said in Isaiah 44, 6, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. In Isaiah 44, 8, he goes on to say, Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I, I know not any. You see, God is the God of gods. Any God under him is just a false God, a nothing God. Why would you worship his creation when he's the creator? Wouldn't it make more sense to worship and serve the creator and not his creation? It, but the sun pictures something. It pictures something that you can't see. It is actually a picture of the S-O-N sun, the son of God. Just like in Malachi 4.2, it says, But unto you that fear my name shall the sun 
and it's a capital. If you look at Malachi 4 2, it says, uh, This is a capital S on the S U N Son. It says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as cows of the stall. So it had a capital S on S U N. Notice the capital S there. And in Revelation 1 16, it says, And his countenance was as the sun, S U N, shineth in his strength, referring to Jesus Christ. The S U N sun pictures the S O N sun. God illustrates what you can't see with what you can see. And the sun goes down and rises again, just like Jesus Christ died and rose again. The sun is a great light, and Jesus Christ is the light. The sun lights the world, but Jesus Christ is the light of the world. You understand what you can't see, by looking at the creation you can see. Romans 1.20 says, For the invisible things of him, the invisible things of him, from the creation of the world, are clearly seen. So the invisible things of him are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Look around and see. Look around and see what God made and created, and you can see the invisible things. Even his eternal power and Godheads that they are without excuse. You look around, there's no excuse. If there are doubts in your mind about the existence of God, then look around. You got no excuse not to believe that God created all this. Genesis 1, 15 through 16. He says, and let them be for lights, that greater light and lesser light. Let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. So what you have here is what people refer to as outer space. It's the second heaven. He's putting these the sun, moon, and stars out there in the second heaven, and all that makes up what people refer to as outer space today. You see, God's located in the third heaven, way up above that. Down below him is the second heaven, where he has the sun, moon, stars, the earth. The greater light is the sun. The lesser light is the moon. And a lot of argument goes back and forth about whether or not the moon reflects the light of the sun or if it is just its own light. But that's above my pay grade. I just I just know at night I look up at the sky and it's and the sun uh, the moon is very shiny. It's it's got light on it whether it's its own light or it's reflecting light. Uh, I'm I'm not that smart, but I just know it's shining at me. But this is the picture. When the sun goes down, the lesser light brightens up the night sky. The night can picture the church age that we are in now. And during this time, the Lord isn't on earth in the sense that he's going to be in the millennium or in the sense that he was in his earthly ministry. So if he's not on the earth in that sense right now, you know, he's omnipresent, so obviously he's on the earth in the sense of he's living in us. That's how he's manifesting himself now is through Christians. So during this time, the Lord isn't on earth in the sense he'll be in the millennium. So we are shining the light for the Lord during the night. So the sun goes down and the, the moon lights up the night. The church age could be the night and me and you could be the moon shining the light for the sun while it's not here. And you're just letting the light of the Lord shine through you. Sometimes you're living great for the Lord, and that's like a bright full moon shining in the night. Sometimes you're not living right for the Lord, and that's like a cloudy night where you can't even really see the light of the moon in the night. So you see the picture there. Genesis 1.17, And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. So the Almighty put the moon the sun and the earth there in place and he's keeping them there. They stay they stay there because of him. They stay put because of him. He is before all things and by him all things consist. Now Genesis 1:18. 
It says, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. Notice he's still dividing. And you know that song which says, Let my life be a light shining out through the night. That's that's a, that goes along with the picture. Genesis 1:19, in the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Notice that the sun, a picture of the S-O-N sun showed up on the fourth day, just like the Son of God manifested himself in the flesh on the fourth day of history. When did Adam show up? Around 4,000 B.C. Then the last Adam showed up, Jesus Christ, on the fourth day, going by how God views time. For, uh, 4,000 B.C., going by how God views time, would be four days before Jesus Christ was manifest in the flesh. 2 Peter 3, 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So notice something else that we don't want to overlook. Even though the Lord said it as if it wasn't a big deal, it says he made the stars also. In uh, Genesis 1, 16, the stars are supposedly just as big or bigger than the sun. So it there's so much out there you can't even fathom it. He made the stars also. And those stars are, are huge, powerful, burning. You see, God's plan was to have an infinite amount of creatures populating this universe. And that's why all the planets are out there. Once the earth got full, it would just branch out everywhere else. And I was listening to some lost men talk, and they were saying that there are so many galaxies out there that have life that somebody on this other galaxy was having the same exact conversation as they were having in the same clothes with the same names and the same looking location just in an entire different world. So they teach that there's so many different worlds and galaxies out there with people living on it, like an infinite amount of galaxies and worlds with people just like us living on it, and that there's so many that there would be the same two people that look exactly the same with the same names having the same exact conversation that they're having at that moment. Now, that's not true because God has people on this planet only. You know, there's not people outside of this planet. God's focus is on earth and that's the way it is now. But when eternity gets here, that's another story. Because in Isaiah 9, 7, it says, Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. All throughout eternity, the Lord's kingdom will continue to grow and never end. That was the plan with Adam and Eve. That was going to be the plan with Adam and Eve. He was just going to keep having children, and their children have children, and their children have children, until the earth just got full. But Adam chose to rebel. But see, sometimes you forget about how great God is and how powerful he is. Sometimes you, you forget about what's awaiting you in the future. And if that is you right now, then tonight go outside and look up, and it will just knock your eyes out. If me and the kids get home late, I'll make them stop and look up at the sky before we go into the house. Because you get so overwhelmed with man-made lights that it can drown out God's lights. And you stop thinking about how there's a God in heaven that made all this. But he's, he's, he made the stars up there. And on top of that, he knows all their names. You look up, you see all those stars. God made all those stars. In Psalm 147, 4, it says, He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. And there's so much out there in space it just goes on and on and on. One day that will be populated in eternity. There's no humans out there now, but there will be. In Psalm 19, 1 through 3, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. It's his handiwork. Now day five, you got the birds and you got fish. It says in Genesis 1.20, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, 
and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. Notice there is more than one heaven, like I said. There is the heaven where God is in the north. That is the third heaven that Paul speaks of in 2 Corinthians 12 too. The place where God uh, puts the sun and the moon and stars is the second heaven. So you got the third heaven where God is. You got the place where the sun, moon, and stars are. That's the second heaven. And now you are seeing the first heaven. In Genesis 1.20, that's our atmosphere where you see birds flying in. In Genesis 1.21, it says, And God created great wells and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind, and God saw that it was good. Right after the sun shows up, right after the S-U-N sun shows up, the next thing the Lord does is create great wells. Once again, this reminds us of Jesus Christ because as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth so when the sun right after the sun shows up he dies on the cross resurrects and as jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly so says son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth that well that reminds us of the resurrection genesis 1 22 through 23 and god blessed them saying be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth, and the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Notice that God used the waters to bring forth life. A lot of people say that salvation is as easy as taking a drink of water. Uh, when you're born into the world, that was when you were born of water. When you got saved, that's when you were born again. And when you were born again, in John 7, 38, it says, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Take the same water of life that got you saved, that same gospel truth, and just take it all over. Let the waters, the word of God, bring forth life, spiritually speaking, and the people around you, the people you come in contact with. And if everyone who got saved also put out the gospel, it could be spread out just like it was with the fowls and the fishes carrying it out all over the earth. In day six, in day six here you have the creation of land animals and man, but for now I want to skip it for now and come back to it as this will lead us into the next scene in the scriptures and we'll get heavy on talking about Adam and Eve. So day six you got the creation of land animals and man and day seven you got rest in genesis 2 1 through 3 it says thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them and on the seventh day god ended his work which he had made and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made and god blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which god created and made you see god isn't taking a rest because he's tired he is taking a rest to give the example to follow. Eventually, he would have the Sabbath where the Jews would rest on the Sabbath day. On the seventh day, they would rest. And that's what he's setting a pattern for. Leviticus 23, 3, it says, Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation, you shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. You see, the Lord wasn't resting because he needed to take a nap. He was resting because he was giving us another picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our rest. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, it says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He wasn't resting because he was overworked. He was resting to also give you a picture of the millennium. The millennium will be on the seventh day in God's time of history. Since one day with, is, with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day, when God looks at time, he can see it from the end to the, to, from the beginning. He can see the end from the beginning, the beginning to end. And it's very short time to him. It's like like a week to him. 
if one day is with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day, to him it was, when Adam was here, it was just like six days ago. And that the millennial reign is going to be a thousand years and it's going to be on, it's going to be on that seventh day of human history, each day representing a thousand years. And during that 1,000 years, what's it going to be? Perfect peace and complete rest. So that's what day seven represents, the millennial rest. When God is sitting on the throne in the millennium, ruling with a rod of iron, ruling in righteousness, and him alone, his name alone will be exalted in that day. So that's the six days of the reconstruction process, the the day seven, the day of rest, and they all picture something. We got all types of great practical truths out of all of them. And it just, all this just excites me, thinking about the things God created and how he's, you know, he's it's going to be destroyed once again in the future, but he's going to reconstruct it all over again. And next time, as I said, I skipped over that day six. I told you it was just the creation of land, animals, and man. We're really going to get into it and break it down that day next time. And I, I want to get into talking about Adam and his, him being in innocence and also his fall.